Welcome to U2 Spain Almost Live. This week, Chris and I will be bringing you five shocking visa mistakes, three frequently asked visa and residency questions, and we'll be arguing with each other about whether red wine should be cold or not, and who's got the best Spanish morcilla. Strap yourselves down. Things get crazy when we talk about food and drink. Join us on the live chat or in the comments below. You are a part of this too. That's what this channel is all about. You're welcome to U2 Spain. Run the theme music. Let's dance! Oh yes, that's groovy. And speaking of groovy, let's meet my regular fortnightly guest. He's my best mate and yours. It's Chris from Upsticks. Hola. Hola, how you doing? I'm not too bad today. So well, it's baking hot in the office. I don't, let's just check the temperature. 32 degrees on my fan. Ooh. So hoorah, a bit sweaty. What's it like down there on the coast? Uh, not too bad today. It's still, it feels warmer than um, what it actually is. I think it's 32 outside, but um, inside it's cool. Well, it's great to see you as always. We've got a new format to the show. Are you excited? I am actually. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be fun. It is. Yes, we've got shorter sections, more focused topics, so you can all get the information you need out there, and we can all have some fun along the way. So we'll be doing this format now every two, two weeks from now on, in between the live shows with all of my other special guests, which will be the sort of the bigger topics that we normally cover with them. So uh, Chris and I are pre-recorded again today, but you can still chat away with each other on the live chat. So if you have any questions for us, though, ask them in the comments below, because we won't be able to see them in the chat. Right, so it's time for the first section, this week's featured topic. And every week I'm, I'm going to have a little jingle on the start of these subject uh, uh, topics so and everything. So I'll just go feature topic for now. There you go. That's your little jingle from me. So the, the topic today is what are the five most shocking visa mistakes? Are you ready to be shocked to the core? So we're going to count them down. I know. Yes. So exciting. Don't know what's going to happen when we get to number one. We could all uh, have exploding heads or something. So let's do a countdown. Uh, number five. What do we have, Chris? Getting the right visa. So That's number one, isn't it? Are oh, you doing sorry. It backwards? Oh, did I do doing it backwards? Oh, have I messed yeah. up the new format already? <laughs> you have messed up the whole format. Now we've told them the number one. No, well, anyway, let's let's pretend that never happened. Let's Go do a them. countdown, shall we, Chris? What's at number five? <laughs> Sorry. At number five, it's the timing. <laughs> how appropriate. <laughs> yeah, how appropriate. Oh, bugger, I can't believe I did that. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, it about, what is it about timing then? <laughs> That's how my day is going today. Anyway, last time I was on video, I got, nearly got hit by a parking gate and got pooed on by a bird. So I suppose it's not that bad, is, is it, it, really? And attacked by flies as well. Everything happened, didn't it? <laughs> and attacked by flies. So <laughs> getting the timing right. One of our number one is the biggest mistakes. And one of the things that literally when we're doing our discovery calls, it's the timing. Because 99% of the time um, when we are having our calls, we have to completely adjust the timing, whether that's for tax or financial reasons or just the fact that people want to move into space in the difficult times that don't meet their expectations so getting the timing right is is the first mistake that we see right and so and number it. four we count down to number four what's that one i'm gonna get this right now i know yeah 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 it's <laughs> number the one that you probably got as number two isn't it <laughs> yeah i got it all the wrong way around turn it all upside down <laughs> Number four is getting the right BLS office. Uh, yeah. There's a common misunderstanding there. You can either go to any BLS office you like, uh, depending on the availability of appointments. But the great news is they all have appointments available, but it's making sure you get the right one. So you have to check that your region in the UK what BLS office that that corresponds to. And sometimes that can be confusing, especially in the north of England and for people in Wales and southern England as well. Yeah, and they, well, I think we both have articles on our websites which have got maps that show you all of the counties that, that, yeah. that cover you. So Edinburgh is basically uh, uh, Scotland and some of the north of England, all of those northern yeah. counties, and Northern Ireland as well. You've got to go to Edinburgh for that. And then, yeah, but Manchester's good. a strange one because it stretches all the way over to to Peterborough, right over the at one side, all the way through into Wales at the other, and the Isle of Man and things like that. So. 
literally is it so if you look you have great examples so if you look at lincolnshire cambridgeshire lincolnshire like i'm from peterborough cambridgeshire and um, we i would be going to london if i lived at home um uh -huh. in peterborough but lincolnshire which is stamford which if i stand on my fence and look over a bit well not quite but nearly um uh -huh. would be going to manchester then you've got places like devon which um would have to go to london but we'll find it a lot quicker to go to to manchester and mm. uh and there's a lot of the midlands which are actually geographically closer to london but have to go to manchester so you know mm. it's, uh, it's always a lot of the time when people ask us where they need to go they're quite shocked yes indeed and if you're from kind of anywhere else in the world and all the sort of lands owned by the uk then you've got to go to the london one that's a long trip isn't it just imagine if you forget your passport <laughs> yeah yeah over the british overseas territory it's all london so check out the maps that's the thing to do number three then that's definitely is my number three and your number three it's the one in the middle we can't get this wrong can't get this one wrong <laughs> <laughs> moving your money to spain before you actually get your visa now um the reason i've added this one in is because there's a common misconception that you have to have if you're using savings or money it, you have to have a spanish bank account and move it over here to spain to then present it at the bls you don't you all your now we're not talking about renewals we're talking about initial applications and mm -hmm. for the initial application there's absolutely no problem with having all your assets cash assets etc in the uk you don't want to move it to spain and not be able to access the documents you need to prove you've got it so you can mm -hmm. keep it in the uk until you've got that visa in your hand yes perfectly simple but a bad mistake if you get it wrong there you go number two then and number two is not apostilling or translating the correct documents mm -hmm. so what so, documents should you so you all registry documents like marriage and birth certificates if they're from the uk would need an apostille and a translation though so if you've got documents say from a european country which are in multi-language standard format then you will you won't need to have them translated or apostille so we get a lot of confusion Spanish medical certificates don't require an apostille, UK ones do. So there's a lot of confusion sometimes surrounding and mistakes made around the um, correct documents to get translated and apostilles, which evidently um, we manage for our clients. Excellent. And then finally, number one, hold on to your hats, it's a shocker, you'll never guess what this one is. <laughs> it is. <I'm> never <laughs> number one is getting the right visa. <laughs> yes indeed or not even needing not even needing one at all as well you were telling me about this before exactly so you've got the first thing to remember here in spain is there are three different platforms in which you can get residency so you have the eu let's call them platforms they don't call them plataformas in spanish but i think it's um an easy way to explain uh when we thinking about online platforms of different things it's an easy way to say it so you've got the eu platform which is its own rules its own laws for people who have anything like a passport or anything to do with the eu eu family members etc you've got general immigration which are for third country nationals who um who haven't got any access to the eu platform and then you've got the investor platform and uh, which are for people who are investing in spain now the, the, the various visas and ways of moving to Spain are spread across those three. So here at Upsticks, for example, we manage the NLB, which is on the immigration platform, the general immigration platform. And we also manage the EU platform as well, um, where uh, people who have access to an EU passport can get residency in Spain. And then you've got the investor platform, which between us and our associates, we manage as well, which is things like Golden Visa and the Digital Nomad Visa. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is a lot of the times in our conversations, the initial conversation I have with people, happened twice this week, uh, three times actually, is because there's so much news and hype out there and very helpful groups, you know, very much like yours, um, talking about the NLV, sometimes the other platforms and information get buried, you know, there. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, you've done a great job on the channel, keeping things like the EU platform, you know, and, and with the DMB, you've been talking to Rochelle on that front, to, to the to the, to the top, because a lot of people get bogged down with all this NLV information, that it becomes automatic, got a British passport, I'm not going to work, I need an NLV. But then when you're talking to people, you realise that, you know, one of them has access to an Irish passport, for example, or uh, uh, I had a, a recent one with a Maltese passport, um, or... Again, it's happened this week. Was I was speaking to somebody who really their their whole tax structure and the way they were doing things, they're trying to mould an NLV into their life. And I was like, I'm doing myself out of a job here, but you're not. You don't need an NLV. I think you qualify for a DMV. And they were like, mm-hmm. really? I thought that was only for the under thirties. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not somebody you need to speak to. So then we all see. We refer them on to, to the specialist who's going to speak. Well, it's with some actually. Uh, see if she can chat to them. Which she won't do. She's on holiday now for August. But I'll... So getting the right visa and doing your due diligence to make sure, because the person who I was speaking to, the DMV, could have quite easily have come in an NLV, but the long-term goal just not worked out for them. Mm-hmm. So there you go. That's our feature for this week. This is about how long these these subject topics are going to be. So uh, if there's anything you want in a nutshell talking about, then do let us know. And in the meantime, smash that like button into smithereens, my smashing friends, especially if you've got some information you need from today's topic. And while you're here, make a note of Chris's website, upsticks.es, where you can find articles about everything to do with visas and residency and also moving your car to Spain. And I think we're going to have a show for you all about that soon. We'll, we'll get Lara back on the show. She was on last week. OK, so uh, at this point in the show, then what we would normally do is have a section called Ask Us Anything. It's something we've done on a few shows before, and it's always been a raging success. Today, though, uh, we're pre-recorded, of course, so we can't see any of your questions on the live chat. So what we'll do is we'll just put that one on the back burner and we'll move to the next thrilling part of the show which is FAQs, FAQs, that's my jingle for today. And uh, the FAQs, of course, are frequently asked questions about moving to Spain or, excuse me, uh, living here. So, Chris, we'll we'll do three of these today, I think. This is something that that we can continue week on week. So, um, which are the most popular questions that you get in your office when people are talking about moving to Spain? So the first one is, how much money do I need? That mm-hmm. is the most popular question um, that we get asked. And uh, what sometimes we, we get asked the question, so uh, really, how much how much money do I need? And I have to respond with, how much money do you have? <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> it's a horrible way to respond. But what I mean is, give me the structure of your assets. And I know it's a lot. Can you imagine talking to a stranger for the first time and then having to basically just pour out everything you own to make an assessment. But certainly we'll make, we can make an assessment uh, when it comes to the visa residency process, really. So obviously, if we're talking about the NLV, um, it's the EPREM that you need to make. So we've, you've got loads on that, haven't you, on your channel? This year, EPREM is what? For the total, for so it's 7,200 a year, but the total for, you talk about NLVs, for a single person, you need 28,800 euros in passive income, uh, or savings, um, and for a couple, it's thirty-six thousand. On an EU platform, it's slightly different, depends on the region that you're going to. But generally, they want to see income or savings per year of residency of one point five e prem a year. So you, know, so you could get away with a lot less than with a non lucrative visa if you're coming as an EU family member. Uh, and an EU citizen. There you go. So if you want a, a much fuller explanation with lots of examples and that, uh, I think we both have videos on that, uh, which we can point you to. So just ask away. So uh, the, the next popular question is... Uh, how long can I leave Spain? So I only wrote down... To, I'm not doing very well, my notes today. <laughs> it's, so only the first, it's only the first show, so we'll, we'll get the hang of it. You let me off. I've been so good with my notes lately. Look, I've look, got yeah. most of them here. Look, there we go. Look. <laughs> and what I need to do is ask ChatGBT, don't I? That's what I need to do. You sort it out, ChatGBT. That might help me out. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the FAQs which we always get asked is how long can I leave Spain? 
and I always have a chuckle with it's like the second question. It's like, blimey, we haven't even got you here yet and you want to leave? <laughs> uh, so the answer is for NLVs, there's a lot of confusion because of this recent law which said it abolished the need to be more than six months in Spain for temporary residence. and no, they can't deny you a renewal uh, if you haven't been here for 183 days. Um, but that would ultimately affect your long-term residency. So if you're going for permanent residency at the end of five years, you can't be out for more than 10 months in the first five years. Again, we ask, get a lot, asked a lot of questions like, well, how do they know if I've gone to Portugal, to France, or across the border? I don't know. Maybe they've got drones that follow you about. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I couldn't answer that. I can tell you stamps in passports and everywhere you've actually got registered travel is supposed to be. When you're registering with a travel uh, a handler, a handling company, somebody's going to transport you from one place to another, they are supposed to, this is why you check in and then confirm the boarding, inform Interpol that you've travelled and you, one would imagine that Immigration and National Border Police, the Frontiers, exactly what they are, who you're applying to, would have access to that information. How they know you've gone to a cheeky holiday now before that, I don't. Usually it's the sort of thing that you need to prove. It's like guilty until proven innocent, isn't it? The sort of very much control. so, yes, it's very much like the uh, tax office in Spain, you know. So, there you go, there's there's a fine because we think you earned that and you haven't, and uh, now you've got to prove that you didn't. But we're going to take the fine and give it back to you if you prove so. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Scary, yeah. And we'll block your bank account and take everything, yes. yes. Well, at least that's the rumors that you hear in the, in the expat groups. <laughs> they oh, take they all do. of your money, they block your bank account, and, and that's it, yeah. No, so I, again, I got asked that question today about, you know, tax. Is it, I've seen everywhere, is it true that everybody gets stuffed for tax? And I'm like, well, I get legally stuffed for tax all the time. I've never actually <laughs> had any money, never had any money stolen from me by at the end. That's the honest truth. I've never had a, I've had two or three embargoes, but they've actually have been legit when you chase them. There's one for a travel, traffic fine, which didn't, um, which didn't uh, get to me. I just didn't see, touched, mm -hmm. hadn't updated my phone number, my digital certificate my fault mm. and another one was when i moved three years ago who didn't go and tell the VA? you to think i should do this because i did paperwork mm. i didn't inform the uh the dress change for one of the vehicles that we had and i'd sold it mm. and then i didn't get a letter for the tax completely forgot got an embargo mm. and it turned out it was a tax office so it's very rare the tax office can't come to your bank and take money without a reason but it's sometimes when things are badly managed and you're not aware of it it can be a shock so the third most popular frequently asked question is passports i, I didn't write it down <laughs> you didn't write it down so it was do i'm, I'm just it's just as well i asked you before the start of the show uh, it is do i get a spanish passport which seems like a mad question to ask because you need to be need to be spanish or i've become naturalized spanish or something to get one of those exactly i get a lot when you when do i get my spanish passport or do i get a spanish passport do you know it's for us because we're always now talking about we've probably done what 70 hours of or 80 hours of live shows and more probably you know, four days back to back i think if you add it up um mm -hmm. um and we're always talking about it. it's quite a common question but for like even people like uh, other family members are like well how does it work do you get a spanish passport do you you know and no we, you don't get a spanish passport so if you get a visa or you get residency in spain you automatically get a spanish passport i recently got yesterday asked yesterday by my hairdresser it's like oh so you're british your wife's british but your kids must be spanish no they're not they get british passports because they're born to two british parents they will have the option when they're adults if we don't change our nationality spanish to change that at that point but they don't automatically get spanish passports so uh if you mm. get residency no you don't automatically get spanish passports. maybe they confuse it between the the card the tie card which i mean after all they call it the nie card some people and if they get that confused with the passport there's i can see why there could be confusion actually but but yeah although passport really is a completely different thing yeah it's nationality but obviously there's no convenio between the uk and spain so um if you did get a spanish passport for under any uh, circumstance you would have to hand in the british one yes yes they don't like you to have a dual citizenship like i've got with ireland and britain that's these that's one of the easiest ones ireland and uk because they yeah, don't yeah. mind they're good friends when they're not shouting at each other 
<laughs> so there you have it we'll we'll have more of those for you in two weeks time and in two weeks time chris will have them written down so he knows what we're doing <laughs> but now it's time for your half time reminder of all of the services available to you as a youtube spain follower and while you're watching that take a moment to subscribe it's very quick and costs you nothing right then lads take it away are you getting the most out of U2 Spain? I don't know! Did you know that apart from these Saturday morning live shows with expert guests or expats with really exciting stories to tell, it's like the Graham Norton Show. Bah! There are videos every Wednesday evening packed with all the information you need so we can move to Spain and enjoy living here without paying tax. No, Colonel, that's illegal. But you can find out how to navigate the bureaucracy successfully. Well said, Walter. How do I find the videos? Just subscribe to the YouTube channel, darling. And click on the bell, you useless Colonel. There's a playlist here called Video Diaries. Oh, now that is Scatz's thrilling personal story about his life and health in Spain. Still alive! Hashtag FOF. You can support you to Spain as well, my darlings, if you think you've learned something valuable. Or if you've been entertained. Sketch looks like he needs your support. The poor bugger can't even stand up. If he was a horse, I'd shoot him. Colonel! He's not a very nice man. It's all right. He's just a two-dimensional stereotype. Aren't we all, sweetie? I'm not. Brexit! Moving on! So how do we support you to Spain? Use the QR code in the corner. Oh, there's a link in the video description below. I can't find it anywhere, darling. In the video description, you idiot. I've warned you, Colonel. I'll send you back to the nunnery. <laughs> While you're watching or pausing below the video, you'll see the title just here. Oh, I see it. Not far below that, there's a description of what the video is all about. It says, read more. That's right. Just click or tap on that and lots more text appears. What's the information all about? There's contact information for the expert guests and lots of links to other related companies that I recommend. And they help out you to Spain if you use those links to get in touch with them. There's so much down below. <laughs> Does anyone have a pen? No need, Tommy. You can find everything on our website. u 2 spaincom And don't forget the Facebook page. And the u 2 Spain community group. Where you can talk to other people like you. But there's no one like me, sweetie. Thank goodness. Is that everything? There's a guest waiting to tell me things. Oh, I do like things. Where's Doogie Dog? That used to be his line. I'm stuck behind a wall. Oh, sorry, Doogie. I'll I'll come and find you after the show. Thank you, master. Get back to the show. I need to go and punch some servants. Oh, Colonel. Back to scats in the studio. Hello again, we're back. And now it's the part of the show you've all been waiting for, probably. It's the big debate. Normally, Chris and I agree on most things on this show, but you can't agree about everything, especially when it comes to taste. So we're going to have an argument about the most important things in life. I don't know how this is going to work out. This is going to be fun. Like, who makes the best morthia? And what temperature should red wine be served at? Things could get heated. And I'm not talking about the red wine, because that would be awful. So buckle up. It's time for Chris says, Scat says, Chris says, Scat says. Ah! And uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, whatever the theme uh, insert is going to be there, I'll make them for two weeks' time. So, Chris, my best matey, or should I say sworn enemy, we'll, we'll find out soon. <laughs> what, what do you have to say about Morthea, the food and the blood of the gods? Oh, by the way, we should explain that Morthea is basically black pudding or blood pudding, uh, whatever you call it. And it's a speciality in various different regions in Spain. I've had a few different types. And I found a favourite. But first of all, what's yours, Chris? What's your favourite? I sort of discovered black pudding here in Spain. And I've done, they've done it in so many different ways, don't they? And mm. I'll let you explain your way. But me personally, and not everybody agrees with me on this one, but I found a black pudding, which now they sell here in my hometown of Alarin. And it is a spreadable. And you don't have to cook it. You literally get it. It's basically more theacon and it's a spreadable butter 
black pudding so you basically you buy it it comes in the round typical shape and you cut the the end off and you get a nice bit of toasted bread or if you don't like it toasted normal and just spread it straight on and literally 50 percent of it is butter which means the butter is like this dark sort of orangey color mixed in with the meat and you just eat it straight away and for me a little bit of salt on the top of it that is the best morthia i've ever tried in spain that's just totally mad what i mean it's, it's, so you don't cook it what what right. is, it? is it already cooked was it yeah it's, uh, it's, already, it's already cooked and slightly cured inside the sausage if you cooked it it would just explode in a big buttery mess and and it's also well, exactly that that's telling you something isn't it that's telling you yeah. it's rubbish if it yeah. explodes when you cook it that can't be good for you it would oh yeah yeah i don't think it's very good for you but it would explode in a big buttery <laughs> mess <laughs> I'm I'm warming to it actually. <laughs> Maybe you can give it to people as a present and say, "Cook this. Make sure it's in your hand when you when you cook yeah. it." <laughs> yeah, it's not everybody's cup of tea, though. I have to say, not everybody's cup of tea. I'll I'll tell everybody yeah. what it, I I've actually tasted it. I'll tell everybody at the end what I what I thought of the taste of it. But yeah. uh, anyway, we'll get on to my favourite and and compare mm -hmm. and contrast. I, I've got a picture of it actually, because I'm prepared with these things. <laughs> I this think we're, is think the we're walking with the work. <laughs> yeah. This uh, is mine. And I found this, uh, let's see, it was in a, a meat wholesalers in Torox Costa, just down on the coast there. And it's absolutely the best I've, I've tasted in Spain. I'd say it's even better than my favourite Irish black pudding. The Irish are very keen on uh, black pudding and white pudding, which is um, there's something completely different about that but they put a lot of uh, other additives in it and more kind of a rusky type thing it de definitely tastes completely different but um uh but the spanish one i think is closer to the irish one than it is to lancashire black pudding which is the traditional proper british black pudding you could you could riot with with black pudding <laughs> that's very <coughs> topical um I'd, i i don't know whether I, what I really need to do is is do a taste test side by side. So I'm going to have to buy some more of this and somehow get some Lancashire black pudding from uh, I think it's Berry uh, where the uh, where it originates. Uh, but it's it's almost a, a different product. This so this one comes from Burgos, which is a name I should have recognised because this is more or less where my car broke down on the way down from uh, from Bilbao when we moved here. So passed right by this, and uh, Villar Cayo is the is the part of Burgos where this comes from. But yeah, so it's way up north, and uh, it was just and it's also let's get the other picture of it the uh, the other side of the packet, and it gives you the ingredients, and it's actually Murcia de Cebolla. So it's it's got thirty five percent onion in it, and uh, it says Olaborada con tripa natural, uh, which is tripe stomach innards and all kinds of stuff there you go but it's it's obviously very healthy because it says sin gluten and sin lactosa so obviously way 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 better than exploding uh, black pudding that's not even cooked <laughs> uh, I, don't know. I, don't know. I can I, I can never get i can never get these right on the barbecue you know it's the one thing maybe i've got something against more fear yeah, because i'm pretty okay on a barbecue i can pretty much uh rock the show but i can never get a more theater one of these right it's like too, nah, too cooked too dry they they just split and every time i put one down people look at it and eat it politely but they don't really like it i'm um, going to bring you some of this and I'll, I'll show you how to cook it it's just it's a piece of cake it's back there a few minutes either side really there you go it's, but that's just uh, that's just all about you being a a crap cook rather than the than the, the more theory being that's, bad, isn't this it? is my more theory nemesis on the barbecue oh, yeah. you give me I, anything on the barbecue i can cook it i did a lamb's leg the other day in the barbecue which was lovely wow. but i can't cook blooming more theory. you can't do that you think it'd be easy it's just like sausage yeah. but just takes probably slightly less time because it's uh oh well because it's so fatty i think it just gets so hot maybe that's the thing you just overcook it because it's uh it doesn't need as long Maybe yeah. they've been incredible more theater just for me. Maybe that's it, yeah. They cook it for you already. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So uh, that's the more theater argument. And I have to say, I did have some of the spreadable. <laughs> it was absolutely gorgeous. So <laughs> I could quite easily. I, just, I, think we, I think we might have a tie there. 
Plus, uh, plus but, the spreadable, there is one more argument for the spreadable. It's from Rhonda, which means that we're supporting local North Theatre. Oh dear, you might have edged yeah. in front of me there. Didn't there we go. Yeah, we uh, got some show going, but, you know. We did. Yes. <laughs> So, what do you think, viewers? I mean, if you have you tasted it, have you tasted the the proper English stuff? I know they serve it in Scotland, uh, and they batter it, it and it's oh, fantastic. Ooh. They do black pudding and white pudding in Scotland, and it's just, it's just a tube, and it's just completely battered. And I had it, I had it that with chips, and oh, it's just <laughs> it's the most greasy thing you could possibly eat, and um, and I quite like that. So <laughs> uh, yeah. There you go. So everybody, what do you think? Have you had the Spanish stuff? Have you had the Irish stuff? Uh, and, and what's the difference and why? Express your opinions in the comments. So moving on to probably a, a more contentious subject, the mm -hmm. temperature oh. of red wine. Oh my God, this has caused arguments and con consternation. And we arrived in Spain and found they put the red, red wine in the fridge. I wasn't amused no. at all. You can't put it in the fridge. Why on earth would you want it to serve, serve it cold? I mean, red wine, obviously. And I mean, white wine, obviously. That's that's nice and fruity and lovely and crisp. You don't want crisp red wine. What's going on there? There's nothing like a crisp red wine on a really hot summer's day, if you ask me. Oh, I keep most of mine in the fridge, to be honest, because you can't get it down to the temperature. Look, it's 32 outside. So where we've got our outdoor fridge where we keep all the drinks. It is about 34 degrees so and red wine's supposed to be served i think between 16 and 18 depending on what it is and it comes out yeah. the fridge super cold within 10 minutes it's i'm afraid in the summer you know you've got to go red wine in the fridge it's just the way forward i'm afraid that's like four to six degrees when you when you get it and you pour it out so your first one or two glasses that you get out of the bottle i mean let's face it you're serving it to everybody around the table that's it that's the bottle gone and you're drinking it it doesn't get up to 18 which yeah it's well i mean what they say is it's supposed to be served at room temperature but room temperature yeah. in spain is 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 way too high so i agree it should be it should be chilled we've actually got a, a chiller which which is at about 18 degrees so that's oh really oh i, I don't see i don't know i just guess i'm like yeah Cold enough, so uh, it's, <laughs> I think I think there is an argument though for. I mean, I do. I have to an absolute heat, I do like red, cold red wine in summer. I think it's good. I mean, uh, uh, we do drink it in a red wine glass, though. I don't go as far. I do go as far as to put it in the proper glass. But um, oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> not, that makes up for everything you've said. <laughs> so I'm pretending, yeah. and I'll never put a bit of ice in red wine. I'm not that bad, but I do oh, like yeah, a bit of red wine out of the fridge. <laughs> thing is red wine my favorite red wines are the ones that are really rich with the kind of the chocolatey coffee uh, yeah. aromas and all of that that stuff and you can't uh, if you take it below you know 10 degrees you don't get that all you get is the fruitiness of it and then and then the rest of it is kind of lost and you can't smell the the deep rich or oh, the all of the stuff i like about red wine and i i don't think that that kind of red wine is that good when it's cold i had this discussion the other day because we we're talking about what wine you buy when family come over and i personally think that good wine and i do like a good wine believe it or not mm. is yeah. just wasted in summer i think you should be banned from drinking any decent wine from mid-june to around mid-september because you can't get it to that point that you're talking about that is true and i do i do agree with you on that point there are certain wines that have to be at that temperature to get the most out of them but summer i'm afraid you've got to go with these airy fairy slightly tasteless riochas and keep them really cold and it's you know summer drink you can't you just don't get the best out of a decent wine in summer I'm yeah afraid. you don't want a full body wine I, yeah yeah i get I, unless you're in a restaurant which is temperature controlled and and it that, and then you've got a good room temperature when you're sitting down and yeah and it probably is 18 degrees which is 18 degrees is the temperature that you get uh all throughout the year in a cave house when you if what? you live in Bata or some place like that granada province yeah it keeps and that's the that's the genius of cave houses it's, it doesn't go below 18 in the winter and doesn't go above 18 in the summer which is cool. really handy it saves you a lot on air con uh, but uh, then you've got to walk outside 
and then instantly you get hit by either freezing cold because you're in Granada province or baking hot because you're in Granada province. Well, there you go. But uh, so yeah. if you live in Granada in a cave house, you can drink decent wine. Inside. Absolutely. That's the place to drink it. Otherwise, it's it's sacrilege. I mean, the, the worst thing is hot red wine. I'm just not going to go there because I, no. I mean, uh, hot red wine at Christmas with spices in it. Uh, don't like that either. I think that's that's just do it. no can't do it that's sacrilege but the thing is if you if you have wine that's too cold or too hot mm -hmm. it it actually damages the quality of the of the wine so if you right. if you cool it down too quickly um it's uh, it's not good for it but you do get those so the best i suppose the best red to drink in that so those circumstances is not the full-bodied ones it's the lighter ones that are just fruity and then they're designed for being a bit cooler and mm -hmm. they do advise that you drink those at more like 13 14 degrees so yeah you can probably do that alongside your white but i i drink white in the summer anyway it's just even when i had a steak yesterday i just had a, a white with it because we were sitting by a beach very warm it's got to be done hasn't it it has it has I, i'm i'm uh, partial i don't really i'm sort of being educated myself with white wines because I was always a bit of a red wine snob. Really, I would just look at white wine and go no. Um, but um, you, I have been expanding my palate slowly but surely, and they do have to be cold as well. But um, I mean, there is an excuse with the red wine that you can do is um, when you've got family and friends coming. If you've got those big jug things and just buy that like six euros for five liters in Mercadona, they can't, and then put it really cold. And just tell mm -hmm. them how they serve it in Spain. They can't taste it anyway. So you, it'll save you an absolute fortune, honestly. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, this is the white wine we had on the coast yesterday, which was fabulous. Quinta Luna. And it's from Segovia. And uh, yeah, it's uh, Nieva. I think that's is that's the grape, isn't it? Uh, right. Yeah, that was that was awesome. I think that's the best white wine I've ever had and it was it was only it was the cheapest of the really good dry white wine and uh, we always go for the dry one because like uh, you like that sharpness with the uh and uh yeah as you can see it's got a batman cloak on that's because it's uh it was sitting in a nice bucket so there you go so that's that's my rec recommendation on there and um my son actually bought me uh, a wines of spain book and it's all in spanish oh, really? So he bought me it as like for two different reasons. I, one because I like wine, and two because uh, I need to learn more Spanish. So um, that's very handy, and I, I've not checked it out yet, but I can, I can highly recommend that. And it was only twenty-seven in the restaurant, which is, which is quite good, really for a, for a good wine. The markup, that, I noticed that the markups in Spain are. I mean, generally it's a fifty percent. So if you get it at 27, it'll be 13 and a half, 14 in the supermarket. But mm -hmm. um, but it's generally quite good because you go, when I've been abroad and in, in, in places, the market's like 75% uh, mm. on stuff. And I went to, last year I was in the UK and looked at some red wine, which was like 30 quid a bottle and you can just uh, Google lens it and it's like mm. 9.99 or 8 quid. And I'm thinking, that's a huge market. Mm. Uh, generally, it's a 50% or... 40 to 50 markup here in Michigan. Hmm. I'll check that one out, see how much they marked it up. I mean, it's uh, Berry Berry, really nice restaurant we were at. In, uh, I do agree with Berry Berry, though. I agree with you on that one. But uh, Berry Berry is nice. And if you ask them, they'll give you cold red wine as well. They will, yes. I've asked. <laughs> Even if you don't ask them, probably. Because yeah, I, yeah, I think it is the generally expected because it is i guess you as soon as you go out and you take it out and they, they've also got seats on the beach as well uh, you know yeah. people lying down and uh, covered over ones where you can actually lie down in the shade and everything so uh, if they're taking wine out to people there then i guess yeah it's going to heat up really really quickly to probably to drinking temperature so yeah yeah there you go so uh, i think i think what we're both trying to say is that eventually it gets to room temperature in the in the spanish heat anyway it gets to a good drinking temperature i saw an expert talking about it well he was french so he must be an expert and he was uh, he was and he and he had two 
doing and he was doing all the smell and the taste and everything and he said the one that was was chilled um a little more it started off with the fruit flavors and then gradually in the mouth if you hold it in the mouth then all of the other flavors come out uh the richer flavors because it's warming up as it does it and that sounds mm. like a good a good thing to do because then you get both both sides of it uh but i don't tend to hold it in my mouth very long it just tends to yeah, go you know, we sat, we sat around the dinner table like it's what you and now oh chocolate oh yes nice yeah so but when you get it out of the fridge you've just lost all of the full bodiedness and the and you get sharp and tangy there you go it's yeah, yeah you're basically destroying what the winemaker has spent a lifetime developing and passing down through his family won't you just think of the children chris <laughs> i should do. do from now on i'm just going to buy the really cheap stuff in summer and as soon as it gets to september i'm going to budget now and see how much i save in the summer just buying the stuff which I'm ruining the taste of, and I can yeah. spend that little bit extra in the in the winter. Now mm. keeping it at the room temperature, can't I? There you go. There you go. So viewers, what do you think of that? Who's who's right and who's wrong? Who's obviously been released too early from the funny farm? Tell us below in the comments. <laughs> so, did you enjoy that? That wasn't really much of an argument. We spent most of the time laughing. So S spreadable more fear with cold red wine. It's the way forward. <laughs> yes no no hot more fear and hot wine not hot wine no just perfect full-bodied wine meaty wine i like meaty meaty and cooked there we go so now we're now we're back to normal again unfortunately that's all we have for you this week and if you like the new show subscribe if you haven't already and join us every two weeks for that and don't miss the shows in between either I'll tell you in a moment who your special guest will be next week. But for now, let's give Chris a big virtual kiss and a hug and say bye for now. See you in two weeks time. So who do I have on the show next week? Well, it's a mystery. I've not confirmed the guest yet because this show was recorded a few days ago. So I'd better not promise anything right now. I will announce it, though, on the Facebook page. So make sure you follow that. And then you can ask questions in advance on there. Thank you to all of you for joining us and leaving comments, hitting the like button and supporting us with donations and memberships. It's very much appreciated. I'll see you either on the midweek video or live on Saturday mornings at our regular time of nine in the morning if you're in the UK or Ireland or Portugal or 10 o'clock in the morning if you're in Spain or Central Europe. That is all for this week. Someone pass around the live show cookies. Peace and love. Peace and fluff and here's one final message from all of the voices inside my head at U2 Spain bye for now wave goodbye lads bye goodbye toodaloo peace and love peace and fluff oi oi don't do anything I wouldn't do one more cosmic dance all right then look mum I'm dancing oh, I'm all a quiver let's dance <laughs>